good idea. Yeah. Welcome to the US presidential election MCC faculty analysis. My name is Rodney Benson and I'm chair of NYU's Department of Media, Culture and Communication. We had originally planned for this event to be about the second presidential debate, which of course is no longer happening and we can discuss that. Um, so we pivoted to a general discussion of the election campaign. Our goal is to discuss American politics and political communication, drawing on the research and, and analysis we do in the department. If you're interested in learning more, I urge you to check out our website, which we're sharing in the YouTube description. I will serve as moderator of this panel discussion. Each of us will offer some opening remarks of around five to six minutes, and then we will discuss for about half an hour. While this is being broadcast on YouTube, viewers can ask questions in YouTube chat and one of us will try to answer. So I will begin with my remarks followed by AJ and then Paula. At the start of the Amy Coney Barrett Senate Judiciary Committee hearing on Monday, Republican Senator Lindsey Graham said, this is probably not about persuading each other. This is probably not about persuading each other. That statement pretty much sums up American politics right now. What seems shocking about Trump when he first emerged, but now seems commonplace, is how little effort Trump makes to win over those who, who already agree, who, who didn't already agree with him. And that still seems to be his modus operandi, which seems shocking, that he makes no effort really to win over those who don't already agree with him. But is this shocking? If you go back to the roots of theory, theorizing and research about political communication, the near impossibility of changing people's minds is a constant theme. In the 1920s, Walter Lippmann in his classic book, Public Opinion wrote, people quote, move as if on a leash within a fixed set radius of acquaintances according to the law and the gospel of their social set. People move as if on a leash. Lippmann was skept skeptical of democracy precisely because he believed that ordinary citizens perceived politics through a distorted lens, a lens shaped by the prejudices and biases of their social set. In the 1960s, scholars like um, Stuart Hall, 1960s and 1970s, scholars like Stuart Hall showed that encoded media messages were not always received in the way that their senders intended. The messages had to be decoded by audiences who made meanings based on their own social class-based experiences. And in the 1980s, Pierre Bourdieu showed how people tend to have a unified set of beliefs, tastes, and attitudes, what he called the habitus, rooted in the social location of their families. In other words, their education, income and professional standing. He admitted that a person's habitus could sometimes change, but it was the exception rather than the rule, and it was very difficult. Taken together, you could say that communication scholars have been saying for some time that if a politician like Trump ever arose who could appeal to and mobilize a social set by activating their deepest prejudices, he would probably succeed. But some other things also had to change for him to succeed. And this is a complicated story and we can address that in our discussion, but I would point to some changes that really accelerated in the 1990s. The, first, the increasing polarization of the electorate that really took off with the Republicans taking back the House of Representatives in 1994. And the House had been in democratic control for at least uh, I think 40 years prior to that. Um, it was led by Newt Gingrich, who is still, you still see him occasionally on cable television and he's an advisor to the current president who really pioneered Republican hardball partisan politics in the contemporary era. Um, the second development was the rise of cable television, which we take for granted today, but that fragmented the market for news in a way that had not really existed before. And that became a political fragmentation once Fox News was launched in October, 1996, which only intensified further with the rise of the internet and social media. It, it's interesting, if you look at MSNBC and uh, Fox, um, at the very beginning in the, in the 1990s, uh, late 1990s, there still wasn't a huge difference in their audience demographics in, in terms of partisan allegiances. But that, has, um, that began to change as they attempted to uh, differentiate uh, their product from each other. So the idea of a general omnibus media appealing across party lines gradually disappeared. And if you look at the audience data produced by the Pew Research Center, most national media today in the US tend to have audiences that are either pre predominantly on the left or predominantly on the right. And so at all levels of society, in politics, media, in our cultural consumption, we've become increasingly tribal, not less like Lippmann, Hall, and Borges, 
vision of society, but even more so. So we shouldn't be surprised by Trump's tribalism, just as we shouldn't be surprised that Hillary Clinton famously called half of Trump, Trump supporters a basket of deplorables. If you look at American history, this kind of divisiveness emerges again and again. What's surprising, I guess, is that we now have a Democratic candidate, Joe Biden, who has relentlessly refused to play that game. He seems to be actually trying to win over people who aren't already in his social circle. And there was an interesting story in the Washington uh, Post on, on Tuesday about uh, this strategy. If we can trust the polls, Biden's strategy is succeeding. He's picking up some of the votes of white working class voters who supported Trump in overwhelming numbers in 2016. He's also picking up some of the voters who went for Green Party candidate Jill Stein in 2016. And it appears that his vote total from Democratic Party stalwarts like the black community will be higher than it was in 2016. And yet there is suspicion that somehow it still won't work. There's a feeling that we are doomed to tribal, potentially violent politics, and clearly that's happening. But I think the possibility that Biden might just win suggests our theories about ordinary people being immune to persuasion may in fact be wrong, or at least a little too absolute. Most people, most of the time, stick their, to their pre-existing beliefs. But under certain conditions, certain people are persuadable in a way that leads them to transcend narrow tribal identities. A lot is at stake in terms of campaign strategy. Should it just be about GOTV, uh, which stands for get out the vote, right? Um, get out the vote of your strongest supporters and don't worry about the rest. Or do things like debate performance or what a candidate says um, or what a candidate does, how they frame the issues. And we might talk about that later. Uh, do these things matter in a way that can change minds and change votes? So this is, this is what I find fascinating about this election and the matchup of these two presidential candidates. Setting aside my politics where I have my preferences, I'm also hoping, hoping Biden and Harris win because when they win, it will prove that to quote Lippmann, we're not just moving on a leash led by our social circle. And to misquote Lindsey Graham, that there still is room to try to persuade each other in this democracy. So, um, those are my opening, uh, that's my opening gambit. And I, now I will uh, pass the mic, so to speak, over to MCC visiting assistant professor, AJ Bauer, um, AJ. Great, thanks, uh, thanks Rodney, I appreciate it. Um, so um, I'm gonna kind of continue with your remarks a little bit, and, but push it back a little bit further. Um, but the case study that I'm gonna use to kind of talk through this uh, kind of longer history, longer regulatory history that's created our current moment, um, it's something that happened last Friday. So um, last Friday, Donald Trump called into Rush Limbaugh's daily talk radio program for what he termed a radio rally. Um, and so this amounted to, to a sprawling kind of two hour conversation between Limbaugh and Trump that amounted to little news. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of news that broke during it other than at one point Trump uh, dropped an F-bomb. He used the, the F word, right? And this kind of went semi-viral online briefly. Um, but for many of Russia's millions of daily listeners, this was an opportunity for direct and intimate access to their favorite president. Um, Trump's ability to maintain his base of support relies heavily on Rush and other talk radio figures daily narrating his administration through a friendly frame. Right, so uh, even with, with uh, Trump recently coming down with uh, COVID-19, right, um, those uh, uh, right-wing media, uh, sorry, talk radio folks have played a really crucial role in, in keeping morale high among uh, Trump's staunchest supporters. Um, so talk radio largely flies under the national radar, media radar, uh, especially among the kind of intellectual and pundit classes that you tend to see on CNN or you tend to uh, be taught by in your uh, classes at NYU. Um, but a main stay, but the talk radio is a main stay for blue collar conservatives around the country. And it's been a highly influential medium for the modern conservative movement in general and the Republican party in particular. Um, so as Paul Matsko, who's a historian of conservative media wrote last week, um, or maybe early this uh, in the New York Times, talk radio was an early adopter of the anti-immigrant xenophobic rhetoric that Trump rode to power in, in uh, 2016. Um, so even before Fox kind of veered uh, right, which it was kind of dragged rightward by Breitbart, which is this online publication uh, into, in 2016, 
um, talk radio was already foregrounding narratives of, uh, you know, a kind of a changing tide of American demographics uh, and, and stoking fears among mostly white Americans who are their audiences, elderly, older white Americans who are their audiences, uh, that there was, uh, that they were at threat, that, uh, that they should be anxious about their status in society being maintained, right? Um, so honoring this long significance of talk radio in general and Rush, Law in Rush Limbaugh in particular, in January, Trump broke with tradition by bestowing the highly partisan Limbaugh with the Presidential Medal of Freedom uh, in the middle of his State of the Union address. Uh, this was highly unusual. These, these kinds of medals aren't usually given during the State of the Union, but uh, Trump had uh, his wife Melania kind of bestow um, uh, Rush Limbaugh with this honor. Um, interestingly, the kind of connections with Trump and Limbaugh go a little deeper even, because there's been some reporting in the Times back in April uh, that uh, when COVID was really flaring up and things were really dire, especially here in New York, um, Trump started thinking about or wanted to host a daily uh, talk radio program from the White House. So something akin to kind of the FDR fireside chats uh, that kind of helped talk the, the, the public through the depression and, and the war, right? Trump wanted to have a similar kind of outlet for him to speak directly to the American people. Um, but he decided against this plan in part because he was worried that it would be a uh, um, uh, competition with Rush. He didn't want to cut into Rush Limbaugh's audience. Uh, and Rush Limbaugh has this kind of three hour time slot in the middle of the day. And so um, it's interesting because, you know, uh, Trump is so reliant upon figures like Rush Limbaugh, right, that he's afraid of breaking in on their market. Um, and so this kind of thought or consideration of the market for conservative media, the com like commercially viability of conservative media is something I wanna talk about briefly in, in the last few minutes of my remarks. Um, so um, it's interesting to know, so, um, Dr. Benson points out that the 1990s were a crucial period, right, towards this kind of uh, rapid political polarization in the United States and the kind of tribalism, emergence of a tribal politics. Um, but a lot of the tables for that were set in the decades prior. And so um, in the 1980s, in 1987 in particular, the, the Reagan uh, Federal Communication Commission got rid of a longstanding policy called the Fairness Doctrine. Um, and the Fairness Doctrine had been in place since 1949. Um, it was a policy by the Federal Communication Commission that basically said, if you get a broadcast license, at this time it was radio, eventually this merged onto broadcast television as well. But um, if you had a broadcast license, you had a responsibility to the public, right? To uh, discuss issues of common concern, controversial issues, and to give both sides of those issues so that the public could have the right to hear all sides of a given issue. And so this was the kind of basic uh, kind of regulatory framework for much of the mainstream kind of omnibus media that Dr. Benson had talked about earlier, um, the kind of uh, big three tele television networks, CBS, NBC, ABC, that everybody tuned into at dinner time, right? They were all operating for most of the 20th century under this expectation that you give both sides of a given issue. So in 1987, as part of a bigger deregulatory uh, project, the Reagan administration gets rid of this doctrine and opens it up. And sometimes this, get narr this gets narrated as kind of a conspiracy theory, like Reagan knew that Fox News was coming and was going to be able to you know, lead conservatives into the future. In reality though, if you go back and look at the archives, the Reagan archives in, in uh, Simi Valley, California, um, there were conservatives on both sides of the issue. There were conservatives like Phyllis Schlafly who ended or uh, championed the end of the Equal Rights Amendment um, back in the 70s and 80s, um, as well as Reed Irvine, who was part of Accuracy in Media, a conservative media watchdog, who were saying, don't get rid of the Fairness Doctrine. We use it to advance conservative messaging against the big three television networks. But you had others like Paul Weyrich, who was this kind of new right political figure, who said we should get rid of it because he had this idea of creating a, uh, a television network, similar to what we now know to be Fox. But interestingly, after so after they get rid of the Fairness Doctrine, which creates space in 1988 for Rush Limbaugh to start his programming at national syndication and develop a, com a commercially viable conservative media, which means that they're able to profit and make money. Um, you also have attempts by conservative movement leaders like Paul Weyrich to create television networks. Um, these early conservative television networks were failures. They were unable to be commercially viable. They couldn't get the, the audience and everything like that that they needed. And so um, uh, the interesting thing that emerges with Rush Limbaugh and the kind of popularity of talk radio and then which Fox News is able to capitalize on with Roger Ailes' kind of uh, penchant for kind of populist media style from 1996 onwards is the creation of a commercially viable conservative media that increasingly becomes a new pole within the conservative movement that takes some of the power 
and control away from the conservative movement itself. And so I think that that partly helps and sets the for a person who talk uh, uh, a uh, reality television host, right, uh, with no connections to the conservative movement, but is able to kind of rise up as a result of that logic. Um, so I'll, that's my end of my remarks for now. I'll turn things over to, to Paula. Did we, did uh, we too much there? You got cut out for a little bit. Oh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, if it cut out, then we'll fix it in post. <laughs> but <laughs> we'll turn it over to Paula. Let uh, me for, uh, let me yeah. say this. Uh, uh, AJ is really a uh, you know leading scholar of conservative media. Now you you uh, co-edited a book. What was the title of that book? Uh, it's called News on the Right. Um, and it's about um, many different chapters about all different aspects uh, about this phenomenon. Yeah, so I really recommend that book if you're interested Thanks. in more. Uh, now we'll hear from MCC Associate Professor Paula Chakrabarty. Paula? Okay. All right, thank you. Um, so I will pick up um, where uh, AJ, uh, Professor Bauer left off in some sense. Um, I would like us to sort of think about the roots of this right-wing um, populism that marks the Trump presidency. And I'd like to begin actually with the George Floyd killing and, and talk a little bit about the specificity of that in relation to um, the election and what, um, what, we, what we find ourselves in the midst of today. So George Floyd was killed by police officers on May 25th of 2020, leading to a global uprising against police and state violence. Floyd's brutal public execution captured on cell phone footage was triggered by a routine phone call to the police following the protocol of nuisance abatement laws, whereby mostly middlemen, ethnic and entrepreneurs who operate as intermediaries between low income clients and large conglomerates essentially function as third party policing. In practice, this often means lower middle class Arab and Asian shopkeepers from communities incentivized to surveil working class African American and Latinx customers on behalf of the police. The purported charge was a machine that detected a counterfeit $20 bill with which George Floyd had purchased cigarettes. Now I begin with this detail because it is important to recognize the intersections of race and class at this particular moment in American and really global history. What stands out in this election cycle is the brutality of American racial capitalism. And I will define what I mean by that term. In response, we see the enduring uprisings, the, the uprisings after uh, the George Floyd uh, murder, and a movement calling for abolition, for demilitarization, and for economic and gender and environmental justice. In a sense, the global pandemic has opened up a conjuncture to make racialized inequalities and, and violence visible. So we were asked in this um, discussion to talk about what is distinct in this election cycle and what are some of the continuities that we can, um, that we can draw on. This election, what is distinct, of course, is with this election is that this election features a white supremacist president who calls the Proud Boys to stand up and stand by during a presidential debate. The cost of homophobic toxic masculinity and white supremacy are front and center, and that might make this distinct. However, we can also trace some continuities. And here, like AJ, I would like us to think about the history of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s that, that lead us to this moment. The racial history of policing in America and its connections to militarized violence abroad is something that we need to think about more carefully um, in, in media studies, in thinking about media and politics. We can think also not just about police violence, but state violence in general when it comes to healthcare inequities, hunger, housing, and wages for essential workers, all in the face of um, indifference by political elites. And we've seen this in indifference from the 1990s into the current moment. 
Um, in the World Inequality Report, co-authored by economists Thomas Piketty and colleagues, they argue that economic inequality is largely driven by the unequal ownership of capital, which can be either privately and, or publicly owned. Since the 1980s, they find in their report from 2018, a very large transfer of public to private wealth in nearly all countries, whether rich or emerging. While national wealth has substantially increased, public wealth is now negative or close to zero in rich countries. This explains the inability or the lack of prioritizing of health and welfare of the disproportionately brown and black communities affected by COVID in the US. Illness, death, unemployment, and the crises in housing and education that we see unfolding all around us. In this election, the election rooted in this COVID crisis, um, we are witnessing the stock market hitting highs during economic hardships for the majority. In a recent talk by Professor Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Professor Wilson, point, uh, Professor Wilson Gilmore pointed out that some 80 million American workers, some half of the American labor force, have some form of disqualifying documents arrest, conviction, or lack of papers. This workforce, disproportionately black and brown, are our essential workers, the domestic workers, the healthcare workers, the Amazon workers, and the retail workers. So the continuities with previous election cycles have to do with the way that traditional parties, both the Republican and the Democrat, Democratic parties, have refused to address this long legacy of these deepening inequalities inequalities reinforced by neoliberal economic transformation of the 1980s and the 1990s. And we also have to recognize while um, Professor Benson and Professor Bauer um, talked about legacy media, traditional media, we really have to recognize in today's election cycle, in today's world, the overwhelming power of big tech. Now in deeply unequal democracies like the US, the truth and persistence of certain axes of inequality that can't be named is what right-wing populist actors take up in their self-ascribed role as disruptive outsiders. We see this in the dog whistle code of populism as a code that has been put into place by the historical experience of an incomplete and uneven democracy and an and economy built on existing but seemingly invisible fault lines. And those fault lines can be caste or ethnicity, sectarian or religious difference, or in this country, race. So these fault lines have been encoded by colonialism in practice by what critics like Cedric Robinson call racial capitalism. The ways in which existing and foundational, foundational racial inequalities are built into Western liberal market um, societies. So the George Floyd uprisings in the wake of the COVID crisis reveals these, these cruel inequalities, which are structured by histories by historical legacies, long historical legacies of settler colonialism, of white supremacy. And it is this that is, has become visible um, in, in today's election um, cycle when there is discussion at the forefront of um, the roots of systemic racism. Now, um, AJ gave us a, a breakdown of thinking about the right-wing media's role um, in shaping these debates. And of course, we have to think about the relationship between traditional media and social media. You see the monetization of media, the kind of clickbait incentives, the publication of fake news, which generates more attention through falsehood. The same story then becomes cycled through legacy outlets and is further amplified. This is what makes right-wing authoritarianism um, right-wing authoritarian um, leaders, whether Trump in the US, Modi in India, um, and many others around the world, have a, a particular affinity for commercial media systems. So while commercial media systems reinforce the power of the xenophobic and authoritarian populist right, we have to recognize that beyond that, right, the faith in traditional institutions, political parties, media companies, the five, five giant tech firms, um, Apple, Microsoft, fa Facebook, Google, and Amazon that dominate the stock market, that, that faith in these institutions have eroded, right, more broadly, and what has come in its place. 
And here, um, in contrast to the right, we see um, social movements. We see the Black Lives Matter movement. We see voter registration, um, voter registration movements to abolition movements, feminist and L LBGT trans rights movements, immigrant movements calling for sanctuary and open borders, indigenous land and environmental justice movements. And in the wake of the COVID crisis, revived and militant labor movements um, led by, for example, Amazon workers and others. When we think of this election as a commercial media spectacle, um, the Trump presidency and campaigns as exceptions to the norm of American democracy, I think we, um, I think, I think we are mistaken, right? We have to think about the norms themselves as being flawed. The Black Lives Matter movement is powerful because the moral argument that resonates and exposes the hollowness of freedom as personal liberty with a, new, uh, with, with a knee on the neck for nine minutes, that is what, um, what, what is the sort of reckoning of this moment um, in this election. When I think about um, how to make sense of this election and how to make, make sense of what might happen, um, whether Biden and Harris are elected, um, or, or, or not, if we fear the worst. Um, I turn to the writings of Stuart Hall, who Professor Benson mentioned um, in his opening remarks, and his colleagues from 2013 when they wrote the Kilburn Manifesto, um, and uh, their essay was called After Neoliberalism, What? Um, this collectively written manifesto was a reflection in the wake of the 2008 global financial crisis in the aftermath of subsequent surge of social movements that spread between 2010 and 2013. The Arab uprisings occupy the indignados in Spain, Gezi Park in Istanbul and beyond. All of these global movements marked uprisings against decades long policies of neoliberalism and austerity. Here, Hall writes about the common sense logic of neoliberalism, which emphasizes the individuation of everyone, the privatization of public troubles and the requirements to make competitive choices at every turn, which he points out leads invariably to an upsurge in feelings of insecurity, anxiety, stress, and depression, right? Common feelings in the face of a COVID crisis today. But Hall reminds us back in 2013 that while neoliberal discourse was hegemonic and thus set the agenda for the debate, there were other currents at play, which included empathy for others, a liking for cooperation rather than competition and a deep sense of injustice. Seven years later in the face of global economic depression, right, not recession, um, Bernie Sanders um, correctly identified a radical generational change in political sens sensibilities, right? Um, Sanders in his concession speech actually talked about not so much the ideological shift, but the generational shift um, offering a different kind of common sense. And I think that's what gives me hope thinking forward um, beyond what happens in this election, right? The fact that the hegemonic neoliberal common sense is no longer holding. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Uh, thank you for your remarks. And, and uh, there's a lot to ponder here in these three, three um, comments. And I'll maybe start off, but uh, I think each of us should feel free to sort of um, jump in with things that we want to discuss more. Um, and I really appreciated, Paula, your remarks, um, thinking on a number of levels, but thinking also about the role of commercial media and the, um, the uh, it's important to, I, I don't think that there's an equivalence between the, the right-wing media and the so-called left-wing media, precisely because the, 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 whereas the right-wing media is really a mobilizing conservative uh, force in American politics linked to the Republican Party. The left-wing media is, is uh, yes, as you say, simultaneously hyper-commercial, not just commercial, profit-driven. Um, you know, we, look at the role that CNN and CBS and a lot of the networks played in, um, you know, giving a, a really disproportionate amount of coverage to Trump in the 2016 election. Yes, much of it critical, but giving him a lot of oxygen uh, and a lot of attention that they did not give to Sanders or uh, Clinton. Um, and even the role of TV uh, and the development of the show, The Apprentice, <laughs> um, 
which also uh, helped in Trump's rise. So I think um, certainly I've done some research on public media in Western Europe, and I would uh, counter that uh, that is one of the big differences. Now, how much difference has it made in the UK? Maybe, I don't know. It, uh, the BBC is a kind of tempering force in, in Germany. The public media is a tempering force to um, uh, kind of lessen that kind of sensationalism around these issues. And uh, we have public media that is, um, PBS has some of those qualities, but it's very small audience. Uh, it relies on contributions from um, large corporations, foundations, and uh, relatively wealthy donors. And it doesn't really have that kind of tempering impact in the American sphere. You also have in the American sphere with regards to public media, NPR and PBS, um, the fact that both of them were put into place by the Johnson administration. And so since the beginning, they've been kind of um, pigeonholed as, as liberal, right? Uh, on the right and among conservatives. And so from the very beginning, those, those non-commercial uh, um, entities in the US have already been kind of coded among a, a significant chunk of the population that makes them distrustful or less trustful of it. Um, so I think it's worth thinking about like the um, you know, it's, it's almost like how to put toothpaste back into a tube or something like that, right? Where it's like, how do you get a robust public media uh, alternative to a commercial media when you have these headwinds of media criticism, like um, uh, popular media criticism among people in the audiences um, that is skeptical of government anything. And I think that this gets back to Paula, I'm sorry, Dr. Chakravarti, I'm, I'm so used to using first names, I'm gonna try to use last names today. Dr. Chakravarti's um, uh, great point about these kind of longstanding, um, the kind of dominant consensus of neoliberalism, right? And this expectation uh, of, of the state as being kind of uh, always doing wrong or always encroaching on, on individual liberty in ways that really still structures, even if we are in kind of a maybe zombie, maybe post neoliberal moment, like there are ways that it's still haunting us. Um, um, but yeah, I saw that connection. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, for me, it's, you know, I, I, I don't consider, um, you know, Rachel Maddow or CNN the left media. You know, I think we have a right wing media sphere um, and we have some sort of center. I mean, you know, and, and um, there is not necessarily a institutional platform for um, the movements, which I was trying to touch upon, right? And yet they still thrive. They thrive through different means, right? And I think what's interesting, what's interesting to me, I think Rod, um, in your comments, you know, that you were, you were saying how there's a kind of increase in tribalism. And I wonder though, you know, um, it, to, to me, part of the issue there is that, you know, when we look at the rise of Trump in the last election, um, there was a lot of writing, right, that basically said that this is the, the this is a rise that that is explained by this kind of you know so-called white working class anger, right? And you have these kind of two sides pitted against each other. Um, and I guess for me, the 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 work that um, I'm drawn to on this question is 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 that there is something to that populist rage, right? That has to do with the fact that institutional actors, whether political parties, whether media institutions, whether these large corporations have failed, right? The people, right? And that there is no such thing as the white working class. The working class in this country is a multiracial working class, right? And so the I, I feel that 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 notion that it, that people are misled and of course they are being misled you know uh, AJ and others have shown the way in which right wing media conspires to lead to those kinds of um, disinformation, but that kind of focus on the uh, on disinformation and being misled I think often takes us away from looking at these structural inequalities right which shape the parameters of the debate right so for me it's not about right wing media versus left-wing media, certainly not in this country, um, but really about the failure of these me media and other formal institutions to represent the will of the people, right? And so, you know, to me, Biden and Harris don't represent the manifestation of that in the future, but should they be elected, there's a movement and many movements which will push them, right, to in some ways transform really what the Democratic Party is, right, and what the media institutions might be. Well, and, and you know, maybe one way to think about this is a short-term game and a long-term game. And I'm not sure that the Biden 
Paris short-term game is the only way or even the best way, but it might be enough to get them over the top. I think there's was, um, you know, an alternative path uh, that Sanders uh, laid out that would have been a kind of solidarity through um, addressing these uh, inequalities and um, bringing people across all these quote unquote tribal lines uh, around economic inequality and uh, the injustices of capitalism and, and racial injustice. And, um, and Biden seems to be distancing himself from that. I think he's taking that for granted. I think he maybe he can because people really want Trump out. <laughs> people, and I would be, I don't hear a lot of grumbling. I think there's a kind of um, silence from some to the left in the party that they're not totally happy with the way the campaign's going, but they, they're not, they wanted to win. They wanted to win. And, uh, um, you know, he's reaching out to Republicans. He's reaching out to moderates. That's the way he's, he's framing it. But my feeling is um, he's pressing his advantage. I think he's got his base, hopefully, um, behind him. And uh, he wants a big win. And I think a big win is in the interest of everyone that wants uh, some real change. So you're right, as soon as they're elected, they, the, then the politics begin again, right? To sort of what direction they're gonna take. And the Democratic administrations are often an, a disappointment for the left. <laughs> They usually are, and and Clinton was a big disappointment. Uh, Obama was in many ways. Um, and could that have changed uh, if they'd been if Obama had more been more aggressive? Uh, um, could that um, you know the House turning Republican two years into his administration been somehow averted? I don't know, but uh, it's a fresh start, and let's hope um, they they don't abandon some of these principles that we that uh, we think are important just to get elected and just to stay in office. Yeah, I mean, I think that to one little tiny bit of hope, <laughs> right, in all of this is that to me, that one of the interesting things about the Biden campaign, right, is that uh, neoliberalism is a headwind for them, which is somewhat new for a Democratic Party recently in the last, say, 20 years, right? Where Clinton run unabashedly as a neoliberal, Obama was running kind of pretty well as a neoliberal, although with this kind of vague, you know, hope rhetoric. Um, but like Biden's role, for example, in expanding the carceral state, which was this crucial element of neoliberalism in the 1990s, right, has been something he said to kind of, kind of shy away from. Trump is variously trying to like tie him to the crime bill that he sponsored, right? Um, but I think that the way that he's feeling like he has to avoid that instead of leaning into it is a sign that the hegemony is shifting, right? The, the neoliberal hegemony is shifting. And I think that the one benefit there is like, um, like you had, you had said, Rob, that um, you hope that they're um, able to, that the Democratic Party is going to be able to, you know, uh, do a little bit better this time, or we always have this hope. But I think that what Paula brings up too is that movements need to push them, right? We've seen this historically as the movement, strong strength in movements to push the party leadership to do the right thing is important. Um, and I think the fact that Biden is already running kind of uh, guarding his neoliberal flank, right? Not being able to really expand that, that shows first the strength of movements, but second, it shows a, cru a crucial point where movements can apply pressure to a Biden administration if they do indeed win. They can hold them accountable and attempt to actually push them into better changes, like changes that say more uh, Bernie supporters or folks like that would be more amenable to. Yeah, I think the I mean, I think the example you were giving um, AJ about the, 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 you know, the tie between the Republicans and right wing radio, you know, and this, this particular, this presidency's relationship to both Fox television and then AM and talk radio. Um, it makes me think about the Democratic Party's ties to big tech, you know, and the way in which perhaps in this post-election cycle, you will see something else, not because, um, you know, because the political elites necessarily feel accountable or responsible, but because of the world in which we find ourselves, right? I mean, I think I, I really find this um, categorization of the essential worker as a hero um, 
another symbol of the shift in the, the kind of hegemony of neoliberalism, right? Um, the essential worker is a very different category than the entrepreneur and the consumer, right? In our discourse of neoliberalism. And the essential worker is a brown or black man or woman. Um, you know, it's the person outside our buildings in Washington Square Village um, who is delivering the, the, the goods, right? From Amazon, it's the healthcare workers. Um, is the disproportionate number of people who have lost their jobs, can't pay rent, have died and have paid the steepest cost of this crisis, right? So in some sense, that kind of material reality is pushing against the, the ideological, I think, enclosure. Um, and, and here the, the, the race versus class pitting no longer holds, right? And I think to me, that gives me hope. And, and I think that's something that um, AJ, you're much younger than us, um, but uh, <laughs> I think that's something that the young, uh, the, a younger generation of students, of scholars take for granted um, in, in critical debates, which, which actually gives me a lot of hope in the classroom. Mm -hmm. My students that I'm teaching who are way younger than me even too, yeah. right, are already kind of intuitively uh, getting this in ways that, uh, you know, I remember at least in grad school, right, we were having to have debates about it, and now the debates aren't even you don't, or you don't have to like stage those debates even with the students. They're just like, oh yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah, class and race, yeah, I get that. They're connected, right? <laughs> Which maybe this speaks to NYU students and yeah, props to NYU yeah. students. I think not. <laughs> I think beyond. I think it's a bigger trend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, I wanted to pick up on um, Professor Chakravarty's comment about you know the words that we use and uh, the, the you know and so yeah, I think that's really powerful to to talk about that 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 phrase, essential worker. And uh, it makes me think of another aspect of Stuart Hall's work and the kind of Gramscian hegemony framework is, uh, is often used the word framing, you know, and how you frame uh, the issues can, can have a real impact. Let me, uh, I'll throw out a couple other phrases that maybe have been a little more controversial. And have these been, you know, with uh, George Lakoff is uh, someone also who talks about framing and the importance of um, using words that, um, play to your strengths, right? So uh, recently the, the phrase that's been used a lot is court packing. Now, uh, and is court, pack, court packing, it makes if people, people who know their history, would, they might recall that that's what FDR was accused of trying to do and he failed. And uh, I read one account that said, maybe we should start using the word court balancing or something like that, but I think that matters, court packing. And so that, the, the liberals, the Democratic Party is actually using that phrase. They're not, it's not being forced upon them. They're actually calling for it. And then, so then that pushed Biden into a corner where he felt he had to say, well, I'm not necessarily for court packing. Um, he might've said he's for court balancing, uh, but it was partly because I think the framing of it from the start was not necessarily a good way to move that forward. The other one um, is, you know, defunding the police. Now is defunding the police is, it's, it gets your attention. And I think um, there's a whole story to be told there if people will listen to it about the history of the police and the role of the police. Um, but on the other hand, it's a frame that uh, scares some people away. So is that a, is, was that a good tactic to use that phrase? Um, and again, maybe we can make the short-term, long-term uh, distinction there. Do either of you have any thoughts on either of those? frames or other frames? Thoughts, but I'll defer, I'll go second. <laughs> You'll go second, is that what you said, Adrian? Yes, of course, I'll, I defer. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I would say that on the court packing, I mean, I think in some ways, you know, the, again, we're talking about legitimacy of institutions, right? Legitimacy of the court. And I mean, I, I, one thing we didn't touch on in our, in our five minute remarks, we were constrained is, um, is, you know, this election, like all American elections have global consequences, right? And so many of the um, trends that we're talking about are trends that we see across the world. So just as we see the rise of these right wing authoritarian figures um, like Trump, uh, in the US or, or say in Europe, um, we see similar um, practices around the world, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Modi in India, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in all of these places, we also see the, the ability of, of the judiciary to hold uh, the political um, institutions accountable um, fading, 
right? And, and disempowered. And so there is a crisis of the kind of constitutional democracy that, that America likes to promote around the world. Um, and I mean, it, you know, we can talk about that in many ways, but, but one way to think about it is that, you know, the U.S. has a history. Um, you know, when we talk about misinformation campaigns and Russia interfering in the U.S. elections today, um, most of us don't think about the long history of the U.S. Um, you know, playing a direct role in misinformation campaigns, often aimed to um, throw democratically elected governments out of power, to disempower um, institutional checks and balances when um, political interests don't align in Asia, Africa, and Latin America during the Cold War, after the Cold War. And so in some ways, the legitimacy of these liberal democratic institutions, I think, are what we see around the world um, in a state of crisis, right? And so we really are in a moment of remaking, right? Um, uh, the future of what democratic politics might look like in the face of these um, institutional, um, in, in, in institutional crises, these multiple overlapping institutional crises. Um, and defunding the police for, you know, is, is, is a similar kind of issue, right? Defunding the police also, um, is a call to refund other parts of um, the state, right? Education, health, welfare. But it also speaks to defunding the military, right? Uh, defunding or decreasing, right? Um, Sanders and others introduced a bill to decrease the Pentagon budget by 10%, right? Um, so that that money could be put into um, other, um, other costs that didn't go through. So, I mean, I think, you know, I think that the, the what these terms imply have to do with these larger institutional crises um, that have impacts not just in the US, um, but abroad, right, that, that are connected. Um, so yeah, so that, that would be my long-winded academic answer to your question, Rod. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I really agree with that and think it's a good way to frame it too, because uh, getting into frames, framing it. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that you're right that we're at this moment of crisis in terms of the li liberal constitutional state in the US and in other countries as well. Um, and that at this moment, and this get, gets to your point right about the long-term and short-term of it, is that there is something about these frames that are radical framing. So I think it raises the question, what does radical framing do, right? Radical framing expands the kind of Overton window. It expands like what we're able to consider or think, right? That doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna achieve it immediately, right? Um, and there's going to inevitably be backlash. Like of all the things I study among conservative media and on the right is no matter how you frame it, there's gonna be backlash. They're gonna find a way to backlash. That's like what they're really good at, right? And so um, it almost doesn't matter what you frame it, you're gonna get that. And the question is, do we go with kind of a milk toast middle ground framing that yields kind of like a weaker backlash possibly in the near term, but limits our scale of vision? Or do we go with a radical framing that allows for these really capacious scales of vision at this moment of crisis when things are up in the air and being reconsidered? Um, that, you know, even if we don't get, for example, to abolition or something like that, you know, I know defunding the police has been the phrase that is stuck, but it started out with abolition earlier in the, in the term, like not term, but like, what is it, April or May or whenever that was. But I, I want us to think also about like, what is this, this kind of reclamation of abolitionist language that we've been seeing in the last few years, but particularly the last year with regards to say abolishing ICE, right? Abolish the police, right? Abolish the military. And I, very radical people are in that conversation. But, but I don't know whether those are useful in terms of like what's gonna happen tomorrow. But I think that what we can think about is like, what are our students hearing right now? Liberal institutions are under crisis. We have this moment where we can fundamentally reimagine our world and our relationship to one another and our relationship to the state, et cetera. And what sorts of vision do we want people to be, like the, the scale of vision do we want people to be thinking about? And that, that's like the closest or the best argument that I have for like radical framings is that yes, the right is gonna look at police abolition as like a terrible frightening thing. And Trump is gonna say law and order a million times and that's gonna rally a certain segment of his base. But if you look at the public opinion polls at the moment, right, which again, maybe not quite right, but if you look at how they're doing, how Biden is doing this week, he's doing okay. Right? The number of people who are responding to those, uh, you know, the Trump kind of uh, uh, reaction or, uh, to those radical framings is an increasingly smaller base. 
And among that base that is still okay with Biden, they may not support abolition, but the fact that they have to think about is like, what does abolishing the police look like, right? Changes the conversation in a way that I think will yield benefits down the line. Um, that's my best defense of radical framing, even though it, it makes not serve us in the interim or in the meantime. Yeah, is there, can we say there might be a division of labor here? You know, yeah. I think that there's a role to, to get you know, new issues on the agenda, to say them in a way that gets people's attention. And then there's also a moment where the frame needs to create solidarity to put those, uh, you know, put that into action. So, I mean, I think again of someone like Sanders or FDR or Johnson, who, um, you know, administrations that really did make some dramatic changes. And they needed to, they need to frame it in a way that wasn't uh, milk toast, but but in a way frame it in a way that um, invited um, solidarity across uh, lines that might have normally been opposed. So, I guess what I'm saying is I think there's 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 a role for both kinds of framing, and um, I think a more what might be called a more moderate approach to framing is not necessarily um, less radical if it's the, if that's the vehicle to kind of uh, put those into action. Yeah, and I was indicating radical less about like uh, ideological spectrum and more just in terms of like staking out a case in like a far extreme to just drag the conversation a little further. Yeah. Um, but I hear your point. And I think diversity of tactics is crucial and different people have different roles to play. Is what? Yeah, Go ahead, go ahead, uh, Professor. No, I was just gonna say, I, you know, and I think that it's, um, for, for many people, it's not a matter of choice, right? To, to take a moderate versus radical um, uh, position. Um, because if you're on the receiving end, um, if you're an undocumented person, um, I, I just remember that, you know, the night of the election, the, the 2016 election watching, actually, I won't name names, uh, Professor Benson, but with a sociologist friend. And, um, and I remember him saying, well, this is terrible, um, but it won't affect us. It won't affect people like us. Uh -huh. um, and it was very interesting to me because I've often thought back to that because of course it has, because we are not all the same. And, all, and, um, and I think that your frame in response to this moment of crisis will also determine on who you are and how you are affected, right? By these um, material <laughs> structural inequalities. And so if you are from a community that is targeted by the police, if you are, if your family is being thrown into asylum, into, uh, you know, cages, um, or you know people um, from those worlds, they come into contact with you, people who can't pay rent, et cetera, et cetera. you know, they, that shapes, right, the way that you respond to this moment, right? And I think that's what we're seeing. Um, that's what we're seeing all around us, right? So, um, and I do think there's some lag between the theorizing and the doing at this moment, as there is in any moment where there is radical change, right? Um, but I liked what you said, AJ, about this kind of need for big ideas, right? Um, people said when Occupy failed that there was no impact, there was no electoral impact, but we see the longer term impact. I mean, precisely that, that shows you the short term, long term, right? Um, arc of those kinds of movements. Um, right. And so I think it's interesting. I mean, our conversation, I think, points also to the way in which political communication as a field often fo focuses on elections as the main sort of um, objective analysis. Sure. Um, and clearly, there's a need to think about elections in relation to the social world, right? Civil society, social movements, and, and the kind of big P politics in relation to small P politics, right? And the media are at the middle of all of that, right? So um, I think our conversation marks that um, um, that discussion. And I think that's, that's absolutely right. As long as we, um, uh, I mean, I think you could also argue that what's happened over the last four years is for some on the left who maybe were a little skeptical that elections matter, they now know that elections matter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, they do matter. Um, just wanted to, we, we need to wrap up in, in a few minutes, but uh, I wanted to kind of come back to one um, theme that I'd brought up in, in my opening remarks around, I guess the word I didn't really use, but I was getting at was, is solidarity, you know, and so solidarity. So I think um, Professor Chakravarti's comments about, you know, what seems radical kind of relates to your position. That's another way of saying, yes, uh, how we perceive reality and what resonates with us is related to our position. And that's 
that's not just tribalism. That's just that, that is that is the structuring of social reality for all of us. But then the question is to get things done, to to make the the marginal movement move in, a, in into a position of power to actually implement the the changes that it's advocated for to affect change. We also need to speak to each other across our social positions. And uh, I'm just wondering if, if the if this is a moment, maybe um, your reading of your students uh, and and uh, young people today, is there a yearning for solidarity, a broad solidarity, as well as for justice and change? And how do we think about the relationship between these two? AJ, you go first this time. <laughs> okay. um, so this is like complete anecdata, so it doesn't mean anything, but um, when Black Lives Matter happened the first time, so 15, I think that was, five years or so ago, um, I was also teaching at NYU, although I was a grad student at that time, but um, I remember asking students, how many of you have been to a protest? And very few of them had. Um, and the ones that had tended to be students of color, right? Um, this past experience, right, with protests that's happened, I've been similarly asking students how many have been to protests. And the number of, of students um, who don't come from backgrounds that are directly impacted by police brutality, right? So white students from elite or, or you know, well-to-do families and things like that, I've noticed an increase in protest activity, like that they've been going and they've been showing up. And, um, and I think that that bears out a little bit in the numbers, right? Even if you look at polling responses to support for Black Lives Matter this round versus 2015, that there's an increase, right? Um, and a lot of that increase is built into like, um, you know, white communities and, and well-to-do communities that maybe were more skeptical before. Um, and I don't know if that's an app, if that's an expression of an appetite for solidarity, but I think that that's an ex that, that that's evidence of some form of solidaristic feeling that's happening. I think my question is, um, and it, I guess maybe I think about solidarity similar to how like, I guess, LaCloud and we've talked about chains of equivalence, right? Where you see of equivalent struggles or struggles that you're willing to kind of be a part of through whatever, right? Um, and I wonder whether Trump's existence in the pres in the White House, right, is creating uh, like a gravitational pull that enables certain kinds of chains of equivalence or solidarities to form among different peoples, right, with different material realities. Um, my concern is what happens when you pluck that out, right? Um, mm -hmm. Is the form of solidarity that's been built during the Trump administration that I think is real and tangible, is it resilient um, or is it, is he somehow perversely the gravitational pull that keeps us all together, right? I think um, I am hopeful that, that, that there is some resilience, but I think that that's a real question that we'll learn um, if and when he loses or is no longer the leader, right? Um, but anyway, that's my thoughts about that, that question. That's, yeah, that's interesting. Um, it is interesting to think about that, um, the, the chain of equivalences through the antagonism towards this one, right? Yeah. Um, one figure. Um, and we will see, and we will see that around many parts of the world. Um, I think one thing to keep in mind um, that in, in many other parts of the world is that you've had a, um, you've had left parties or liberal left parties um, come apart, right? And you have the kind of rise of the right with no, no formal opposition, right? Um, and here it's not it's not clear what the future of the Democratic Party will look like after this election. I think, I think we will see um, what the relationship between the party and the movements, um, uh, how they configure Black Lives Matter, the you know environmental justice, indigenous rights. I mean, you know, these are all robust movements um, that often work um, across each other's interests um, and with each other. And so I, I think we will see how that plays out. Um, I think in terms of solidarity um, and thinking about solidarity, we just, you know, it can, it can swing um, quickly. I would, you know, I, I need, um, you know, I need to have a kind of um, optimism of the will to get through this. I think we all do, right? In this Zoom universe. Um, but but I think that it, it's very important to actually keep our eyes on the um, political um, uh, nuances and institutional politics of the right 
um, as you're doing, AJ, in your work, um, while at the same time we look at social movements for justice. Um, you know, so I mean, I think thinking about the dynamics of politics um, is really crucial for us as media scholars. I think as media scholars, sometimes we get too swayed by the moment and are either saying, oh, look, social media gave us revolution in Egypt and Occupy, or oh, look, social media created fascism, right? <laughs> you know, we're often, we're, we're often too moved by that um, as opposed to sort of thinking about the larger political, economic, institutional um, transformations in which media are embedded, right? And I think um, um, I think our conversation speaks to that, right? Speaks to the kind of embeddedness and the need to kind of keep our eyes on the larger world as we sort of think about the role of media in society. Mm -hmm. That's, maybe that's a good last word. That's a great plug for MCC. <laughs> Um, but yes, solidarity forever also. <laughs> yes, honestly, for real. <laughs> and, and, and then we'll see after the, the administration takes office who's in that big tent and uh, if we can all keep everyone together in that big tent. Yeah. So here's to hoping. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for um, your comments. Um, and um, I think that's, we'll close there. And um, thank you for joining us. And if you're, again, if you're interested in more information about um, any of our work, you can find that on our website and, our, and, on, and uh, of our faculty and our department in general and all the work we do and about our students. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>